I am Daniel Lucas, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I've read for the last 40 years, and today I have my special guest. He's the author of several books, no other than Mr. Gideon Hodge. Welcome to Book 101, Mr. Gideon, and can you please introduce yourself? Um, so I'm an author uh, living in the Southeast. I'm actually from the Midwest originally. Uh, I moved back and forth a lot between Atlanta and New Orleans right now. I <clears throat> uh, had an extensive background as a performer and entertainer. Uh, I've been writing for a very long time. Uh, over the last several years, have focused down more on my writing. Uh, I now teach workshops um, online and in person as well as um, I've mentored a couple of other writers. Uh, but yeah, my focus now, I've got my, my YouTube channel, which is called uh, Grayscape Storytime, which is focused on um, folk tales, mythology, things like that. And uh, then Aether Sphere, as we're talking about here, Aether Sphere is a steampunk fantasy series. Hopefully that was what you were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> went all over the place on that one. So, Mr. Gideon, what is your short-term and long-term goals in writing? Uh, so, right now, uh, I mean, basically get the books out, get the books out there, let people know about them. Uh, I am also uh, developing a practice of helping people write their books, so um, helping other people tell their own stories as well. Uh, so, I do a little bit of ghostwriting. I do a little bit of mentoring or uh, story editing, things like that developing that side of my uh i guess business as well because that's that's one of the things as an independent art author is i mean you really um you really are in business for yourself you know you're the one setting up your appointments you know getting out into festivals events conventions things like that workshops so you know doing doing workshops at different locations in georgia right now they've been very well received and very happy about asking me to come so uh, those might turn into series workshop series rather than sort of the, the individual workshops that i've got now um so yeah uh basically just building on the brand and then uh book two is set to come out later this year uh with book three hopefully releasing in early 2020 good luck for your goals mr gideon but before we go on to your other book Raj, let's do the recap of what we talked about last episode, Lilith Redemption. Uh, so Lilith Redemption is a retelling of the Lilith myth. Um, the mythos is very much, you know, woven throughout the story. Uh, it is a tale of her modern day avatar being tasked with hunting down the demonic children that she's left behind while pulled over at demons now. And uh, I tried to, I, I spent about a year or so just really finding any source material I could for the myth. So that way I, um, one, had like a clearer picture, but two, I wanted to be true to the myth. Uh, I've seen a lot of depictions of Lilith as like a monster or a demon or a vampire. And I, I feel like they're just very, they're just slapping the name on a character and not really doing a lot of justice to um, the mythological character uh, herself so i wanted to delve into that story and and give as as honest and true a retelling of that as i could um in in this version very well said mr gideon so please do listen people to our episode uh last week and yes it will be published probably the end of this week so mr okay. gideon let's talk about your other book. So Aether Sphere, the the first book is really just kind of tip, dipping your toe in the water um, as to what's being what's going on in the overall mythos. There, uh, I spent a lot of time world building for this series. Um, I wanted there to be. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a history major by by academia. Uh, a lot of my friends were getting creative writing degrees, English degrees, but I felt like they weren't really telling a lot of stories. Um, and so I jumped into history to just have a, uh, 
a plethora of stories to pull from. Then I got myths, folklore, you know, all that. So there's all these stories that I'm familiar with that I can kind of weave in and out of my writing as, as, I, as I choose. So I wanted Aether Sphere to have a very rich backdrop in that regard. So I wanted to flesh out the nations, the sort of political landscape. And not that the, the book isn't a political story or a or like a stale a story of intrigue. There is some intrigue in there, as there would be, you know, with any sort of uh, Victorian empire. But the focus is more on the kids and their journey as these sort of larger than life events are taking place. So there's this organization called the Artisers. They are a group of people that had figured out how to fuse magic and technology and make these just wondrous machines. They had done something to upset the Emperor ages ago and were banished. And so um, pieces of their technology were left behind. And those pieces, some of that technology is coming back to life now and is um, activating and doing bizarre things that nobody really knows how to counter. And because all the artificers are gone, artificers are gone, nobody knows how to repair or, or stop these machines. Um, it begins in a place called the Wastes, or at the edge of a place called the Wastes, which is where a former kingdom existed and was wiped out. And so all there is is desolation, ruins, uh, you know, bent metal, broken stone for miles and miles and miles. And our main character, uh, the boy in the middle there, Slade, he lives in a small town at the edge of nowhere, you know, near the wastes. He is a, a child laborer. He is put to work by the state, um, mistreated, malnourished, um, doesn't have the best life. And he is one of the closest people to the events that unfold from the wastes, where there is a group of people <laughs> uh, referred to as the Withered Hand. Um, they are an organization that dates back centuries in this mythos that served the forces of darkness that were humans that served the forces of darkness ages ago and uh, their organization is reappearing for the first time and they are congregating in and around the slave's hometown but also there's something going on in the waste there was a light that comes up in the waste and that doesn't happen in centuries and so the garrison of the local guard is kind of flabbergasted they don't know what to do how to react um, I'll let the story tell itself from there. I think I've, I think I've hopefully set the, given the setting there pretty well, but yeah, it's going to be a very sprawling storyline. Uh, I've got eight or nine books planned, and then I have a secondary arc that I want to release after that. Um, so this is, this is going to be an ongoing project for me for some time. Man, good luck for that, Mr. Gideon. So what was the writing process like of either Spear? Um, I mean, it went back and forth. I, I probably spent a, a quite a bit of time on world building before I even knew what the story was. I had a vague idea of what story I wanted to tell, but I really wanted to flesh out um, the history of the world and then give the... Um, you know, kind of give a, a fun backdrop for the characters to play in. <laughs> um, funny story, and uh, this is, this has come up elsewhere, but uh, there was a house fire. I had a house fire when I was, I had books, one, I had dr rough drafts of books one and two. And um, my, my house caught fire while I was away. My girlfriend at the time, now wife, calls me to tell me there's a fire at the house. So I go racing home. I'm thinking kitchen fire you know, small fire. I am a few miles away and I can see the clouds of smoke coming up into the air. I can see uh, fire engines cordoned off a two block radius. So I had block parked two blocks away and just ran the rest of the way. And that's where that iconic photo comes from where I'm, you know, like this, just racing towards my house. Uh, my laptop with the manuscripts are inside. Uh, I got crap from the entire internet for not having everything backed up on the cloud. I've had bad luck with the cloud where uh, things of mine will disappear off the cloud or I'll go to move something and it'll take it off my hard drive as well. I did have multiple flash drives that I had backed up the data on. All those flash drives were in the house. I did not plan for my house catching fire. Um, I do now. I always keep a back backup flash drive. Uh, I upload a lot of things onto cloud sources, so I, I definitely make sure there are multiple backups of my work currently. But uh, so. 
I ran into the house while it was on fire. Like the fire department is actively fighting the blaze. I ran underneath, you know, I snuck past the fire department into the house, got the laptop and ran back out. And so that was um, the manuscript that I've been working on for the last several years, uh, kind of expanding that world. I think what I, what happened is I wrote one story and then realized that a lot of things needed to happen to set the, set the stage. And so that manuscript, so I said I have books one and two. I actually had books one and four. Am I doing that right? Or four, four and a half, four, four to five. I had to move everything forward and then write everything that happens beforehand to kind of set the stage and move everything forward. Um, keep it engaging, you know, keep the story uh, well paced while I'm trying to get to the place that I had written several years ago. So the writing process, I mean, has been all over the place. I am trying to get better on outlining and then following an outline. Um, but sometimes it's fun to just write and see where the page takes you. You know, uh, things will occur to you while you are writing that don't necessarily occur to you while you're outlining, you know, where you're trying to take more an academic approach to it of like, okay, I need to have this happen and then this happen and this happen. And then you start writing and then the scene kind of manifests where it takes it takes things in slightly different direction than you were expecting and that's that's part of the magic of it and i feel like that's letting the muse speak to you and and you know just take you by the hand and run with you when you follow a lot of fun things happen and i think that is some of the most dynamic writing right there at least from my experience where you just run with it see what happens and see where it takes you very well said, Mr. Gideon. So how did you come up with the title, Aether Spear? Hmm. <clears throat> well, so at the time of the fire, I was asked by a news crew why in, why in the world I would run into a burning building. And uh, they asked me then what the title was, and I said, Engineers at Fire. So the original working, I didn't have a title, I just made one up on the, on the fly there. So Engineers Empire was a working title for quite a while. Aether Spear... The title of the book is usually the last thing I think of. Um, like for Lilith's Redemption, the entire book was written and I had no idea what the title was. Um, but I looked at the story and that told me what the title was. So Aether Sphere refers to something that will be revealed throughout the course of the story, uh, what the Aether Sphere is. Um, so to me, all of the events of the story revolve around the Aether Sphere. And I, you know, the mystery of that will be released little by little throughout the story. Um, there's a completely different set of events going on. But um, Aether Spear, so Aether is, there are these stones. Um, you find out where they come from later on in the series as well. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil too much. But uh, we, they are called Aether Stones. And each one has a charge towards a certain element. Um, but elements are not overly simplistic. So I didn't go the realm of like earth, fire, wind, water. Um, the Aether Stones, um, the, their elements are things like electromagnetism, uh, heat or um, fusion, uh, resonance, uh, in the, um, spectral energy, and psychokinetic energy. And so each one of them has sort of a facet that they explore, and there's a lot that can be done within that realm. So a an either an either gem or either stone is not just a static. It only does this thing. There's kind of an array of things that can be done with a a, a single either stone, and um, so either either plays a lot a lot into it. Either is the backbone of the uh, magical tech that is created. And we find out where that stuff comes from and the significance of that throughout the course of the story. Yes, interesting novel, Mr. Gideon. But before we go on, I want to shout out my ranking tops in the last 30 days. Because in Bolivia, I got number two on the Apple chart. Pakistan at number eight. Nigeria at number 12. United Arab Emirates at 16. Oh, Bhutan at 25. Jamaica at 61, Japan at 74, Cameroon at 81, Egypt at 88, Thailand, and a lot more. Thank you so much 
for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created and power writers all over the world like Mr. Gideon Hodge. So Mr. Gideon, could you describe the main characters or themes in a ether spheres that readers can look forward to it? Sure. So the um, the main characters in the first story are Slade. Slade is the builder. Um, he grows up poor in a very poor uh, poor town. Um, he is dreaming of a better life. In the meanwhile, he's been studying um, <clears throat> engineering and building things by himself. He builds uh, small machines and, and contraptions to kind of make life a little bit easier for the people that live in his small town. And he is the, one of the first ones that gets caught up in these events. There's a little bit of an Oliver Twist element to him and his two friends, uh, Jeffrey and Tyler. They are the ones that kind of get into some mischief. Je Tyler is the more snarky, you know, sassy one. Uh, Jeffrey is more the one that gets a little is the nervous one, the one, the voice of reason, like, hey, guys, we probably shouldn't be doing these things that we're doing. <laughs> then they go on to meet uh, a group of nobles that are on their way to what's called the Masquerade Ball. Um, there's a lot of things that revolve around the Masquerade Ball in the story, in the first book. And uh, they meet people from Kanak, which is sort of a Celtic background country, Scythe which has a sort of Germanic feel to it. And then um, uh, Le Bon. Le bon is a sort of Mediterranean romance language type of, type of country. And so each one of them has their, each one of these characters that they meet, uh, Xander, Celeste, and Locke, each have their own sort of outlook on the world uh, based on where they come from. Each, and that kind of gives you an idea that each kingdom within the empire um, or region within the empire sort of has its own ideologies and beliefs. Uh, Locke is very much caught up in poetry and food. Um, Celeste is very much focused on, you know, honor and discipline and serving her country. Xander is more uh, experiencing life, just, you know, seeing where the wind takes him and, and seeing what adventures await him along the way. Uh, Xander's so those are probably the main characters. And then Genova. Genova is very important. She is a traveler. Uh, she comes from a sort of uh, gypsyish background. And her people are called the Zemeshe. And they are uh, travelers, collectors of tales. Uh, she tells some stories in the book that are relevant throughout the story, or throughout the narrative. Um, and she kind of also represents a different outlook on things. Whereas Slade has been has grown up without very much, but very isolated. Genova grew up. You know, she didn't have a lot of possessions, but she had her family with her, and so she's. It's uh, the friendship that uh, culminates between Genova and Slade. Um, that's been a lot of fun to watch unfold because they share a lot of um, common outlooks, being from a more you know lower income sort of strata versus their friends that are all more high society. But it's been fun to see the different viewpoints of the characters and how that plays out throughout their discourse or even the arguments. Interesting, Mr. Gideon. So did you draw any personal experiences when you're crafting either a spear? Gosh, it's, always, it's always a tough one. Um, sometimes it's hard to see it. You know, sometimes it'll be somebody from the outside that'll be like, oh, you're referring to this, weren't you? Um, if somebody knows you well enough, I would say that there is there is definitely part of me in Slade. Uh, Slade is a builder. I am not a builder, and nobody wants me building anything. Um, but you know, I, I grew up without a lot of money. Um, I grew up, you know, dreaming of you know adventure and 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 nicer places. I also always wanted to get into things, figure out how things work. Um, my brain ended up going more towards a storytelling aspect of how our stories work together, how do we tell these stories, what's the significance of them. So I would say there's a little bit of me in Slade, there's a little bit of me in Xander, because Xander just loves to just, you know, take a leap and then see what happens when he lands. 
<laughs> uh, lock I can empathize with because I'm very much a foodie. Uh, love food. I love going to restaurants um, and just just sampling cuisines from all over the world. So, I mean, there's little bits and pieces of me sprinkled throughout the story. And sometimes I'm making fun of myself uh, as I'm poking fun at one of the characters because it's an aspect of me that I'm, I'm kind of making light of. Uh, so I don't think there's a single character that's like a, a, a vehicle for me, but there's definitely aspects of my personality and outlook that I've kind of sprinkled in throughout the other characters. So Mr. Gideon, what do you hope readers will take away from your book after they finish reading it? Uh, a sense of wonder. Uh, a sense of uh, just jumping into another place and seeing where it takes you. Uh, I hope they enjoy the world. I hope they enjoy the story and the characters. Um, maybe a little bit of belief in what is possible for a person that where you are right now is not where your circumstances will always be, for better or worse, uh, since you know change is the one constant in the world. And also uh, the idea of second family, you know, and I'm not uh, saying that to discount, you know, biological family by any stretch, but sometimes you find your people along the way. And so, you know, connecting with a set of friends that become a second family to you can be very important and uplifting, um, you know, as long as you uh, find the right people and stay aware of who you are along the way. Were there any particular authors or books that influence your writing style or content of well, either sphere? I'm sorry, I cut out. I, I think it's less than you said. Yes. Were there any particular authors or books that influence your writing style or content of either sphere? That's hard to say. I mean, there's a lot of uh, writers that I'm a big fan of. Uh, Diana Wynne Jones, uh, Neil Ga Gaiman, um, Stephen King. Although I wouldn't say there's any Stephen King. Yet. Well, I mean, there's there's some creepy uh, <laughs> elements in this story as well. Uh, I don't know that any of them um, particularly influenced this story. I mean, not, well, there's a lot that takes place in the dreams. That's one of those interesting things. Is like you don't necessarily see the influences until you examine them. So, for instance, uh, Neil Gaiman's Sandman series <laughs> has been one of my favorite books or, or graphic novels. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of the first three books take place in and out of the dream realm. The, the steampunk element, there's uh, a couple of video game series that I'm a big fan of that I think definitely influenced how I, how I wrote that part. Uh, so I would say, I mean, I guess since those are the three that popped into my head, maybe that's it. You know, a little bit of a little bit of Neil Gaiman, a little bit of Diana Wynne Jones, and a little bit of uh, uh, Stephen King, <laughs> but child friendly. Well said, Mister Gideon. So, can you share a memorable moment from your writing journey that had significant impact on either sphere? I mean. Definitely, uh, there was definitely a desk job that I was working. I mean, aside from the fire, uh, I've already told that story. So there was a desk job that I was working at the time that I, um, I'd been an actor for a number of years, and the acting work had kind of dried up, and so I had to go get a desk job. I was not terribly happy with the circumstances, and so I was always kind of dreaming of being someplace else uh, while I'm at work. You know, I mean, I definitely made sure to get my work done, but I would be scribbling down notes and things like that for this story. And I think that's part of what created this world, but also created Slade at the same time, because Slade is definitely stuck in a set of circumstances that he wants to escape in the beginning of the book. And he is dreaming of somewhere else. And so I would say that that was probably part of the parallel is as, huh, wow, fading dreams. I hadn't thought about it in this context, but I I was losing a dream of mine and finding another at the time. I didn't know it at the time, but that's what was going on. But I was watching things in my acting career, uh, at least that particular chapter, come to a close. And then I was opening the door to my future writing career. 
So I guess that was it. Oh, interesting, Miss Gideon. Huh. So how important was research in creating the world or context of your book? Research? Uh, oh gosh, I mean, research is always a huge part of, of my writing. Um, I blame I blame my history teachers, uh, my professors. You've ruined me because uh, I always. <laughs> I just, I, I, it's the part where I enjoy the process. Uh, I enjoy delving into, you know, archives and textbooks and trying to see what I can glean from, you know, these various aspects. So I did a lot of research on weapons uh, from the colonial period of what sort of weapons existed. I did some episode or uh, some research into inventions that existed around the Victorian era. Uh, so this place takes place like pre electricity. But I have, uh, yeah, so I've been putting together, you know, I did a, the, the research was an immense part of this. So it was a lot of fun to help me sort of texture the world and have an idea of what sort of inventions could have existed around this time. Um, and if people's focus had gone in a slightly different direction, you know, uh, wh what would they have done? You know, what, what was so sci-fi for the mid 1800s you know of you know what would what would have been possible what are some of the things that we could have done and doing a lot of research because you know slade's a builder and again not my expert i don't know why i decided to do this myself not my area of expertise so i had to do a lot of research on engineering as well um you know how different types of machines were uh, combustion engines uh the temperature at which sand and silica melt that will uh you'll find out why that's important in the second book um but just sort of all sorts of things to make uh slade's building and engineering make sense then i did research into a number of different languages uh so the the uh, people of Kanab speak a language called Gelreg, which is um a phonetic mixture of Welsh and Irish Gaelic. Um, I have taken elements from uh, research that I've done on um, uh, Romani languages and uh, kind of put together a, a working um, vocabulary for that, for the language that Genova speaks. Um, and then when one of the one or two of the wizards when or spellcasters when they're using their magic there is a language that is based off of a mixture of russian and icelandic that they cast their spells in what a novel mr gideon <laughs> is there a specific scene or chapter in the book that holds special meaning to you uh, in the first book, I'm trying to differentiate the books in my head right now because I've spent so much time just going over them over and over again. In the first book, uh, there is there is a moment where Slade is getting ready to go on his adventure, and he's getting ready to take that next step. And <clears throat> he's heading to somewhere that is dangerous and a little scary. Um, I don't want to give exa away exactly where he's going, but he is thinking about how this is the no turning back place and i have had that step in my own journey a few times where it's like okay once i step in this direction there's no turning back i have to keep going and that can be scary that can be very scary in our lives because where we are even if we're not content where we are we are comfortable we learn to become comfortable to a degree so sometimes taking that step, taking that leap into the unknown is is terrifying. And so he takes that step, but there's a moment where he thinks about it and is like, is this really what I want to do? But he thinks about the, the potential of where he could be versus where he just left, and it becomes sort of an easier uh, step for him. There are a lot of interesting moments in the first book that I'm a, I'm a big fan of, and I, I, I smile when I think about them. That's probably the one that jumps out in my head, and probably the readers will be like, "That's that's your favorite," you know? They they would be like, "That I didn't even remember that part of the book." But for me, that was an important part. How do you think uh, either Spears stands out in its genre or category? 
In its general what? In its genre or category. Oh, I see. Um, well, it is, I guess it, the genre is fantasy, uh, but it has elements of classical fantasy or medieval fantasy. It has cla elements of historical fiction because of the amount of detail that I use from actual history in these books, even though it's a, another world. Uh, it has elements of steampunk, which steampunk is kind of its own genre. Um, and so, so I, I guess that's, that's part of what makes it stand out is that it's a hybrid of a couple of different genres. And then I would say the, the sweeping epic that is going on and the sort of mystery of the Aether Stones and the Artificer technology are definitely two different things that definitely set it apart from other stories. Um, I would say one thing that connects it with some of my favorite stories is the relationship between the characters. Um, I was very happy as I read back through the books to see the, the realness of the characters, of their dialogue, of their wants and needs, of their agreements, disagreements, and the way that they connect with each other. So, in one of the five-star restaurants in downtown Toronto, so please do listen to our latest episode. We talk about one of the supreme sauces in Italian cuisine, the pesto sauce. And one more, our books are out, not only one, but 13 volumes. We pull Food 101, Volume 1, Basics, until 13 is only the books that you need how to create had delicious food available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. So, Mr. Gideon, Heather Spear, what is the best highlight? Ooh, uh, the best highlight. Um, are you talking about like a scene or in general? Gosh, I don't, I'm not even sure how to answer that. Um, I mean, I think the backdrop of the four different countries and the four different guilds is a lot of fun. Uh, you've got the guilds of the sorcerers, the alchemists, the apothecaries, which I'm one of the few people that makes a distinction between alchemists and apothecaries, and I'll, I'll let you decide how well I did on that, uh, and the engineers. But I would say the, the journey, the journey of the characters, of the decisions they make, of the way that they engage with each other. There's a lot of humorous moments um, where, I mean, they're kids. They're all kids. Um, they're figuring things out as they go, they're making things up as they go along, and the way that they end up interacting is, is pretty silly or humorous at times. Uh, some characters being a lot more serious than others, and the way that sort of bounces off of each other. Um, so I think there's a lot to find for a lot of different types of readers. If you like comedy, that's in here. If you like a, a story about... Um, getting lost in another world that's in here if you like a story about found family that's in here if you want high fantasy and a lot of like action that's that's in here too um if you want introspection and figuring out who you are as a human being and as part of the story that's in here too so i feel like there's a lot in here um and this, this is all occurring to me as i'm saying it which is weird but yeah there's a lot in here for a lot of different types of writers Yes, Aether Spears, so what advice would you give to aspiring authors who are looking to embark on their niche? Keep going. You know, uh, keep chugging along. I know there are times that it feels like um, nobody cares. Nobody, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you finish that book, but it matters to you. And you might have a handful of writers, you know, readers that just absolutely love your book. And maybe it helped them make a decision in their lives based on what they saw your characters do in the story. Um, art can be very powerful that way. Uh, so keep going. Complete something. Don't be, a, don't be afraid to finish the story. Because I've seen, I've seen a lot of law authors get stuck in editing limbo where they're halfway through the book, but then they just start, I'm going to tweak this chapter, I'm going to tweak that chapter. Get a draft on. Get a complete story, and then step back and see what changes you need to make. Um, and then, after that, uh, prepare to hustle. Unfortunately, for authors these days, that's, that's as much a part of the game as writing in the first place, is just getting the book out there to people. 
Uh, very well said, Mr. Gideon. And can you please invite our listeners to support all your books? Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, so there's Aether Sphere here. Uh, there's Casimir the Cat, which is a huge book. Uh, that came out late last year. <laughs> it's spelled K A Z I M E R. Uh, one more time K A Z I M E R, the cat. Uh, it's about cats protecting children from the boogeyman, the monster in the closet. And then, of course, there's my first novel, Lilith's Redemption. And, uh, you know, in the coming years, we'll see what else comes out. So, Mr. Gideon, thank you for your time. Also, GideonHodge.com, if you want to see my latest updates. Thank you so much Gideon. for having me. Yes, people, let's support Mr. Gideon, because if you support him, more, more, more novels or books to come.